modifying my Ender 5 to be enclosed for printing ABS, nylon, and polycarbonate, part one. The Ender 5 from Creality is very similar to the Ender 3. It shares a lot of the same components. The main difference, of course, is that it has a cube frame and it has an extra 50 millimeters in build volume, putting it up to 300 millimeters. This printer has performed very well for me, so it's ready for a special responsibility. Previously, I converted my Cocoon Create Touch, which is a one-hal duplicator i3 clone, to be a flexible specific machine. And my TiVo Tornado was set up to print fast with a large nozzle and direct drive extruder. I'm all about specificity, which is why this Ender 5 is going to be modified to suit filaments that need higher temperatures and enclosed and even heated build chamber. This is going to be a two-part series, and in this first part, we're doing the easy ones, the ones that don't require any firmware changes. Now, I have previously covered for this printer, flashing a bootloader, flashing the newest Marlin firmware, as well as a BL Touch, and you'll find links to all of those in the description below. We're going to start by taking a closer look at these filaments and their requirements. A filament that a lot of people are familiar with is ABS and compared to PLA it needs much higher temperatures. We're talking normally around 250 for the extruder and a heated bed of 100. Nylon is a similar story. It needs a nozzle temperature all the way up to 270 and a heated bed of 120 degrees Celsius. Not much different for polycarbonate, it also needs a nozzle up to around 270 and a heated bed again of 120 degrees Celsius. If we examine the specs of the Ender 5, we can see that it's only rated for 110 on the bed and 260 on the nozzle. So why is that? Firstly, the magnetic bed that's fitted to the Ender 3 Pro and the Ender 5. A lot of people say it's only good for 80 degrees. I've tested it up to 100 and it didn't seem to fail. Long term, it's best to avoid reaching its Curie temperature, which will render the magnet useless. Next, we have the hot end, and on the standard Creality design, the PTFE tube runs all the way down into the nozzle and therefore gets quite hot. PTFE is a plastic that emits harmful chemicals when exposed to high enough temperature. Therefore, this is a limiting factor. All of these materials, however, suffer from warping, and as the object is printing, it will want to shrink together as the layers cool, which leads to problems. Firstly, the base is very likely to peel up to alleviate that stress going through the part. Secondly, it's likely to have the layers split, tearing the object apart along the layer lines, so clearly we need some changes to be specific for these filaments. Our first round of mods are things that I've covered previously on the Ender 3, but the good news is they're also compatible with the Ender 5. We'll recap them briefly, and we'll also look at why they suit this particular application. First up, we're addressing the nozzle with a Micro Swiss all metal hot end. The Ender 5 is compatible with the Ender 3 and CR10 hot ends. As you can see, the mounting holes are identical and the rest of the unit almost identical as well. Here it is installed on the Ender 5. It's high quality and good for around 300 degrees. If you want detailed instructions, the link is in the description. Although the PTFE tube no longer goes down into the nozzle, I still changed it for Capricorn tubing. That's because CapTube claims to have the lowest friction of any Bowden tubing on the market. Once again, a full video on this is linked in the description. Next up, the bed, and I fitted a Wham Bam flexible build system. Rated for 120 degrees officially, but rumored to go much higher, this kit is a perfect fit on the Ender 3 and Ender 5. Not only is it rated for the temperature we need, but the performance is so much better than the standard bed. If you want to see my step-by-step -step guide, once again, check the description. Finally, we have the EZR extruder, and although not really needed to print these types of filaments, the convenience is vastly improved. No more jammed filament for me, loading and unloading. I rotated the mounting bracket 90 degrees and lifted it higher so it's in the upper rear corner of the printer and I flipped around the filament spool holder to boot. If you want to see this tested thoroughly, check out this video linked in the description. Next up, we're going to change the part cooling fan duct. And when you're printing plastics besides PLA, you don't need constant cooling, so really it's more for bridging and a lot less important. This particular model is a patron request, so let's have a closer look. This is the Mistral E extruder cooling duct made for the Ender 3 but compatible with the Ender 5. 
Here's the standard and the Mistral E side by side, as you can see it extends further underneath the nozzle. I acetone smoothed my one for strength and to give it a slightly shinier appearance. Installation is a one minute job. Simply undo the two M2 screws holding on the standard duct, insert the new duct into place and reinsert those two mounting screws. As you can see, it sits just the right amount above the tip of the nozzle. Time for a back-to-back -back water test. You'll see it turn on in a split second here, and although the motion of the water increases, there's no real divot that you can see underneath. Now the Mistral E. Once again, the water is swirling, but once the fan turns on, you can see a divot directly underneath the nozzle here in line with the red wiring. To test if this made any actual difference to print quality, I tried my cooling fan torture test. Here are the results side by side. On the bridging test underneath, I'd say it looks identical. The spire in the middle looks identical, just like the four overhangs on the outside of the model. Oh well, at least I know I haven't made it any worse. Next up, I decided to try out some bed braces. And a lot of people are concerned that the Ender 5 with its cantilever design for the bed is prone to saggage as the filament is deposited. I thought I'd test out these braces to see how much improvement I could actually measure. There were a few designs on Thingiverse, but this one had the best feedback in the comments, so I printed it out. This is a nightmare print for ABS, but the Wham Bam build surface did a fantastic job. As you can see, it only had a very minor lifting on one end. After it was completely cooled, it self-released just like glass. Very satisfying and easy to use. The quality of these parts in ABS on the Ender 5 was generally quite good, but on closer inspection there were some cracks in the exterior, just like we discussed at the start of this video. Therefore I decided to acetone smooth all of these to increase their strength, and this had the desired effect, melting the cracks back together, and even repairing one section that had completely snapped off when I accidentally dropped it on the ground. To complete some sort of objective testing, I set up a ruler and a camera to measure the deflection when specific weights were applied. I first measured with one kilogram and then a second one kilogram microplate before commencing my installation. These are pretty easy to fit. They push against the back bearing and then they rotate sideways clipping onto the underside of the bed. You then take the rear cap, put it into place and tighten up the four hex bolts until it's secure. Time to repeat the deflection test. Once again, without the camera moving, one kilogram and then another one kilogram plate. This is probably heavier than any object you would print on an Ender 5, but the testing makes for interesting viewing. When I take all of the individual frames and overlay them, you can see that deflection is around about half between standard and with the braces fitted. This one is definitely worthwhile. My final step for this installment was to put on this enclosure. Let me talk you through how I did it. I started by buying myself some clear plastic and here are the sizes that I've measured and cut. Most of these are forgiving because the acrylic is going to slot inside the V-slot extrusions. I also found this printable hinge design on Thingiverse and I printed out two of those. In each corner of the printer you need to undo the same two bolts. There's one from the top and one from the side and you need to remove them from all four corners. There's also two bolts that need to be removed on the top back of the printer, one on the left and one on the right. And once these are done, the entire top part of the frame should be loose and be able to be removed from the printer. We're not removing it completely, however, rather we're setting it aside so we can test fit our acrylic pieces. They should now simply slide down from the top, ready to mark out and measure holes, which we can see on the rear, there is one in the top left. I determine the exact location by sliding it into place and using a sharpie to mark a dot before taking a step drill and enlarging the hole so the plug could fit through. The next time you slide down the plastic sheet, the hole should be there so once it's in the base, simply take your loom that you've unplugged, fit it through the hole and plug it back into position. You should find that the holes don't need to be in an exact location and as long as they're close to the approximate location, they'll work out just fine. The left hand panel is super easy because we don't need to drill any holes, but on the right hand side it's a different story. We have four and it's very easy to miss the one in the lower left for the LCD rumor cable. Now we can turn our attention to doing the hinge on the front and you'll need some spare T-slot nuts. I had some M5 lying around and I used them to attach the upper and lower parts of each hinge to the printer first. I could then introduce the center part of the hinge that bolts onto the door 
and slide through a long M5 bolt that was going to act as my hinge pin. Repeat for the second hinge and then measure and make sure they're the same distance from the top and bottom so it looks symmetrical. You can now take your front door piece of acrylic and it's designed to be a fit just inside the frame. This next part's really delicate, but you have to juggle it to get it into place and then support it from the rear as you drill through a hole for where the screw is going to attach. I used washers and lock nuts to make sure that it doesn't vibrate loose and was quite satisfied by the smooth hinge motion and the flush appearance on the front. That's it for now, but in the next installment, I'm gonna start by adding a proper door handle and then I'm gonna think about a top cover. And that's gonna be very challenging because the whole thing moves. It's gonna be hard to get something that doesn't get stuck in the way. So please, I'm very open to suggestions. Leave them in the comments below. In the next video, we're also going to change the main board and we're gonna look at adding a chamber heater on the inside. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.